investigated. This is an occasion, and it's an occasion not just because the bishops present. It's actually an occasion because of the commitments that are being made by these people that you see here, see here, both from this church as well as from the Church of St. John the Baptist in Orlando. And St. John's delegation, I'm very glad that you're here with us. Welcome very much. I, uh, they're making what I think are courageous commitments. You know, we prayed at the beginning of the service in the collect, which is meant to express the sentiment of all that we are gathering to listen to today in terms of the scripture, that they may boldly confess Jesus as Lord and Savior. Now, that's even being acted out in the fact that they are doing this as a public service in front of all of you. It would be a different kind of service if, if this group gathered with me in my office and we closed the door and we shut the curtains and we had this little private ceremony and nobody actually really knew about it. Now, I must tell you, there are some places in the world where that actually has to be the only way it, it can be done. There are plenty of places on this planet, I know, because I have friends in some of these countries, where to make a commitment to baptism and confirmation and ordination could easily put you on a death list. And it is not that they are not afraid to proclaim. They are not. But what happens in these ceremonies is that they don't want other people to get in trouble because of the commitments that they are making. And because of that, those services are held in secret. We are not in a position in this country where to make a commitment in confirmation or in reaffirmation or to reaffirm the baptismal vows or to be received or to be received in the First Communion puts you in a difficult spot as a citizen of the United States of America. Although you know if you speak out a little bit too loudly for your faith, there will be people even in this country who will look at you like, well, who are you? And why are you saying these things? And so, because that's the case, they are making a commitment to be courageous even in the face of difficulty. Even in the face of difficulty. And if you notice, I want to take you back to the scriptures. That when people were being called to repentance by John the Baptist, he asked those who were willing to repent to do, in fact, some difficult things. They said, and what shall we do? And in reply, he said to them, whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. In other words, to be a Christian who boldly confesses Jesus as Lord and Savior means that everyone matters. There's not meant to be the haves. And then the haves not, right? But we are to be men and women who are looking out to see where God would want us to be generous with people in need. That's not just a commitment for some people. That's really a commitment for all of us. That is a part of the commitment that you are making. And by being generous with people who are in need, you are saying something terribly important. By that action, you are saying these people matter, not just in my sight, but more importantly, in the sight of God. You see, in the sight of God, there's never haves and have nots. They're, they're haves, and God is looking at them and saying, well, what are you going to do about the rest of my children? You can't say, you see, oh, well, well, I'm not related to them, or that's somebody else's problem, or maybe the government needs to do something. Well, the government actually might need to do something, but that still doesn't let you off the hook. We're meant by the mercy and grace of God to be generous with whatever it is that God has given us, whether it be a lot or whether it even be a little. You remember the story, remember of the widow's mite? She didn't have much and she put in one couple little copper coins, which were worth less than nothing. And yet she was willing, even in the midst of her poverty, to be generous. Now, I want you to know that the generosity, though, has specifically to do to care for people in need. So even, hopefully, you know, I don't know whether this is true or not, right there. If, this, if people are giving into the life of this church, I hope they understand that the reason we give, even to the church, is that so that more people may hear the gospel, so that there are no haves and have-nots, 
so that people out there who are hungry can be fed, so that there no in other words, it's not that the money just comes and stays. We take care of the things we need, but it also flows through to the wider world. Even the same as it is for us, God gives us financial resources. He gives us talent and time. And sure, we use them to take care of the people for whom we have responsibility in terms of perhaps family. But it never is meant to stop there. It's supposed to flow through us. So even as it flows through us, just those in need, so also even from, through the church. It flows not just into the church, but through the church to help take care of those who are in need. He, John goes on. Even tax collectors came to be baptized. And they asked him, see, they knew that if they were going to be baptized, it was going to mean a change in their pay. You always ask, God, if you're going to do something in life, how did, what does it mean for how I'm supposed to change? And he'll show you, I promise. What should we do? And he says, collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. That means a willingness to be honest, to not to take from your employer or to take from others, but allow in your business dealing to be known in your community as someone who treats people fairly, who is above reproach, who is willing to give people what honest wages in fact should be and not cheat them out of something. You know, haven't you? You've worked for good employers and bad employers, yes. May it never be that those inside of this church are bad employers. That is a mark to the witness of Christ. And then John goes on. And then he says to the soldiers, and what should we do? He said, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusations. In other words, if God has given you a position of authority over others, that means it's your job to serve them in such a way as that they are glad that you are their boss. Did that, does that make sense to you? Even you see here as a bishop, if, if my clergy are not saying, we're so glad he's our bishop, he shows up when we're in need, I can go to him and talk to him about the things that are happening, and I know that he will make the time and listen. Ooh, haven't you heard of pastors and clergy and what's said about them? You know, they really don't care about anything unless it's money. Then they'll come and talk to you. That is not what we are to be about. You see, I've been placed in a position of responsibility, and I am accountable before God, not just before others, but before God, about how it is that I exercise this responsibility. Same is true for us. No matter who we are, whether we're talking about our responsibility as a parent, in terms of how we deal with our children, whether we're talking about who we are as someone who has people who works, work for us, or people who volunteer with us, regardless of our station or responsibility, the word of the soldiers is God's word to us to be fair, to be honest, to be kind in dealing with people. Because that's a part of the calling of what it means to be a witness for Christ. And it's tough. I know a man, for example, who was actually who was a work for a finance company. And he was fired from his job. Why was he fired from his job? Because his boss asked him to do something dishonest with the accountant in a way that would cause the company to make a little bit more money from their client. And he said, oh, I can't do that. I can't. That's unfair to the client. I would never do that. He lost his job. It does happen. And so a part of even the commitment that these people are making, and that you have already made if you have been baptized and confirmed, is that you're not going to cut corners and skirt around the edges for the sake of job security, even though you may be tempted to. Because I'm accountable before God for how I exercise the authority that God has given me. And that's true for each one of us. So a call to generosity, a call to willingness to take responsibly what it is that God has given us, to treat people fairly and well, to be kind to others, to be known as people who don't cheat, 
who are generous in their giving, all of that is implied by what it means for these people to make these very commitments. You see, you can read the Bible every day, you can come to church every Sunday, but if you don't do those things, do you think God cares? The behavior matters to God, you see. The behavior really matters to God. Because you see, since in God's eyes there are no haves and have-nots, that means that you're not in some kind of special place that lets you off for bad behavior if you're a Christian. Oh, because you're baptized and you belong to me, you can do whatever you want. I don't think so. No, because just the opposite is true. We are called to a deeper place of servanthood precisely because we are Christians. And so we ask the hard questions of ourselves and we help one another. Because quite honestly, we can get in dilemmas because of these commitments. And we need I need somebody to help me think this through. I need somebody to pray for this because I'm in a tough spot. And if I'm going to stay, if I'm going to stay in a position to be committed to Christ, I might lose some of my business, or I might have people walk away from me who are my friends. It's not easy, and it's not meant to be. Did you hear that? It's not meant to be. We're willing, we're saying, in essence, as Christians, we're willing to pay a price. So, that is why, whether we, it be in confirmation, or even in the prayers that we sang, about the coming of the Holy Spirit, we're saying, I need God's help to do this. Because even though I want to be courageous, I want to confess to you, God, that there really is a part of me who just wants to be quiet and fit in. Doesn't want to stir up any kind of trouble. I don't want anybody to somehow think not so well of me. I don't know that I have the courage to stand out. It sounds like a great idea, but I, uh, that's not the kind of person I am. And so we need God's Holy Spirit to come and to do something inside of us, in us, that we cannot do for ourselves. Jesus, John the Baptist said that when Jesus comes, what will he do? He will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Holy Spirit meaning God empowering us to do things that we can never do on our own. And fire meaning he's coming to purge. And to cleanse out of us, whether it's the fear, whether it's the sin, whether it's the cowardice. All of us have places where we need to be purged, right? Not your head. Don't just sit there and say, oh, I wish so and so were here to hear this. <laughs> so all of us have places where we need to be purged. And you see, that's what Jesus is promising, that that is what the Holy Spirit will do. That's what the fire is all about. It's about burning away the chaff, the things that we don't need, the things that hamper us, the things that really keep us from allowing that real wheat that God has put inside us to really break forth in a whole new way so that what happens through us looks like Jesus. That's the real way. I, I can't do that. But Jesus in me can Jesus in me came. So even if it means burning away some of the dross, some of the chaff, so that the real wheat can come through, the Jesus in me, the Holy Spirit in me, I, I want that to happen, God, because I do not want one to be one of those people who stands before the judgment seat of Christ and God says, well, what were you thinking? I want to hear, as far as might be possible for me, the well done, good and faithful servant. So, as we gather today to celebrate the baptism of Jesus, we should look at its meaning and what's happening with the commitments that these people are making. Jesus stepped out of the crowd, prayed, got in the water, the Holy Spirit came upon him, and public ministry took off. Even as these, they're going to come forward, they're going to be prayed for. We're going to pray for the Holy Spirit to do a work in them. You've already been baptized, you've been confirmed, but you may need somebody to pray for you. I need some help right now. I want to find a way to be that kind of courageous Christian, and I confess to you, I know that's not easy. But if we are called to, what's the word, boldly? Say boldly. Boldly. That should characterize 
what God is doing in us. What is He doing? He is making me bold. So today, this is commitment day. And it's a commitment to faithfulness to Jesus, to boldness in the gospel, and for God to work in us by His Holy Spirit, whatever it is that we need to be purged from the things that keep us from that, and to inflame us with His power and life. Let's pray to Gracious Lord, I thank you that we are yours and that you love us dearly. And that even if we have wandered all over the place, you are the kind of wonderful shepherd that brings a word that calls us back. Invites us to kneel before you, to say yes to you in new and deeper ways. And Lord, we do confess to you that there are times when we do not want to be bold. And oh Lord, I ask that you would overcome the chaff in us, burn it away, so that the boldness of your Holy Spirit may come through us in honesty, in straightforward, in generosity, and in kindness, and a willingness to confess by our behavior who you are as our Savior and Lord. We yield to you, and we ask that you would strengthen us so that in every way, wherever we are, we might be yours. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen.